As engineers, we're very proud of our work. And when we design our engineering masterpieces, we want the very best, right? The highest quality components, gleaming gold connectors, bling! Nothing is too good for our work. But, of course, there is also our management, with all their crazy ideas about profits and the bottom line. And we really do want people to be able to afford to buy that thing we've worked so hard to create. That means we need to drop the bomb. Yep, we need to spend some quality engineering time focusing on the bill of materials. Bomb cost can really be a fun challenge, too. It turns out it's not just a matter of looking around for the cheapest components. There are a lot of engineering decisions you can make using the very best components that can eliminate other parts altogether, and sometimes make your design better in the process. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. If you design with FPGAs, there is a lot you can do to reduce bomb cost while actually improving other aspects of your design. My guest today is Maureen Schmierden and Darren Zacker from Xilinx, and we're going to get to the bottom of all this bomb stuff. <laughs> yep, it's time to talk about bomb busting. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you'll find additional information on bomb cost and a host of related topics at the Xilinx Low End Portfolio page. Hi, Darren and Maureen. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. Thank you. So, Maureen, why is bomb cost such an important consideration for so many designs? Well, in order for any product to be successful, it needs to be profitable, and profit is what you can sell the product for minus the bill of materials, or bomb cost, manufacturing, shipping, and sales cost. Of those knobs, the bomb cost is often the one you can most easily dial down. For products in cost-sensitive markets, low bomb costs are even more critical. A system's bomb cost consists of several interdependent components, so it's best to take a holistic approach to achieve the lowest overall bomb cost. Looking at the cost of just one component isn't going to get you to a true minimum because of the interdependence. We'll look at some of the best methods for reducing bomb cost along with some real-world examples. What do you mean by methods? Like, say, looking for the lowest cost FPGA? <laughs> well, you don't find an FPGA in every system, but you do find them in a lot of them, including low-cost systems. And the FPGA is one of the highest value components in the system. So it's naturally the first place to look for reducing overall system cost. But another way to frame the problem is this. If I use an FPGA or another programmable component like our Zinc SOC, how many other components can I eliminate from my design? So let's start on the right foot by doing the right math. The cost of any given component selection includes not only the component cost itself, but also the cost of other required support components, like memory for an application processor, and the cost of the circuit board real estate for those components. Component selection impacts printed circuit board cost by affecting the required board area, the number of board layers, and the need for through holes and blind vias. The cost of processors, ASSPs, memory, and, yes, FPGAs, all impact the bomb cost and also affect performance requirements and sourcing flexibility. So it's important to do the right math by taking this holistic view, examining the impact that component selection has on the design of the whole system and thus the overall bomb cost. Well, with a variety of devices to choose from, how do you determine what's right for your application? The best strategy, one that's worked for more than 40 years, is to use more system integration to eliminate components. Our FPGAs and the Zinc SOCs are really good at this. If you take advantage of all the features in a programmable device, you can actually reduce both bomb cost and circuit board costs. Okay, Maureen, show us how that works. Sure. Let's start by eliminating components through system integration. The advantage of a programmable device is not just having customizable digital logic, but also the broad array of functions available in today's devices. 
The high-value digital components in a system are typically processors, DSPs, ASSPs, FPGAs, or a combination of these. Non-digital components can include ADCs, sensors, and PHY interfaces, among others. You can use one of our devices to implement the functions from most or all of these components. High-density system integration lowers bomb cost, reduces board space, and therefore board cost, cuts overall power consumption, lowers packaging and cooling costs, and reduces the cost and complexity of the power supply. That's what I meant by looking at the problem holistically. Great candidates for cost reduction through this strategy are external CPUs, analog mix signal, thermal and power supply monitoring, physical layer ICs, and safety and security components. Okay, Darren, so can you tell me about each of these? Well, almost every electronic system requires a processor to connect to a network to interact with a human, the human machine interface, or HMI, or to interact with a machine host for observation and maintenance applications. That processor can reside in a Zinc SOC, which has an on-chip dual-core ARM Cortex-A9 processor, or with one or more microblaze embedded processors instantiated in the FPGA's programmable logic. In each case, eliminating the external CPU and memory typically reduces power consumption, simplifies I.O. requirements, reduces board complexity, and cuts cost. And that's all the downstream effects of system integration that you were talking about. Impact to cost, power, development time, all of which, as we say, are interrelated, right? Right. Next, because analog mix signal components like analog to digital converters and amplifiers continue to be major contributors to a system's bomb cost, our Arctic 7 and Zinc 7000 device families provide an on-chip integrated analog mix signal block called the Xilinx Analog to Digital Converter, or XADC. The XADC contains two 1 mega sample per second 12-bit analog to digital converters, or ADCs, with an analog multiplexer that provides 17 external voltage inputs and on-chip temperature and power supply sensors. For many embedded designs, this block completely replaces discrete ADC and thermal monitoring components. When coupled with signal processing resources in an FPGA or in the Zinc SOC, the XADC can simplify and reduce the cost of the entire AMS signal chain. Fantastic. So what about this external PHY? Okay. Given the growing array of interface standards and protocols, an external device, sometimes called a physical layer IC or PHY, might be used to translate the electrical signals to a form that can be interfaced to an existing integrated circuit. Our devices offer interface support and IP that remove the requirement for external PHY components for almost any sort of I.O. protocol. For example, HDMI Video IP compliant up to HDMI 2.0 is available for all Arctic 7 and Zinc 7000 devices. This IP removes the requirement and associated cost of an external HDMI transmitter receiver and replaces it with resistors on the receive side and simple drivers or level shifters on the transmit side. Other supported interfaces include DisplayPort, Zowie, V by 1, 3G SDI, and JESD 204B. That's a collection of video, networking, and wireless interfaces, just about anything you can name. For any of these protocols, you can eliminate multiple components and reduce overall system cost. Okay, Darren, so what about safety and security? What does that have to do with integration and eliminating components? Well, a growing number of applications must meet industry standards for security, functional safety, and reliability. If these requirements apply to your system, you know that complying with the appropriate standards is not trivial, and meeting these standards can significantly impact the bomb of the overall system by requiring physical separation of certain functional blocks, potentially forcing you to use expensive multi-chip solutions. Our devices offer the highest level of security, from the top-of-the-line Vertex class devices to the Arctic 7 and Zinc 7000 families in our low-end portfolio. We offer a unique isolation design flow, the IDF, for all low-end portfolio devices that you can use to guarantee physical separation of functions within a single device, reducing the overall component count. Huh, okay. So does IDF really work? And what kind of industry acceptance are we talking about here? Oh, it works. IDF has been approved by multiple governing bodies for compliance with several relevant standards. 
it substantially reduces the number of components required in the system and thus overall bomb cost. Wow, so it's pretty clear that there are several opportunities to eliminate components with the right FPGA selection. So for those components that can't completely be integrated, how does an FPGA or programmable SOC at least reduce the cost of these? Well, many of the components on the board form an infrastructure just to keep core system elements performing to specification. Examples of these include components related to power delivery and thermal management and both non-volatile and volatile memory. The cost of these functions is sometimes overlooked, resulting in higher bomb cost and lower system performance. Other areas for cost reduction include the logic capacity of the FPGA as well as the actual PCB. Careful device selection can simplify all of these requirements and provide a more cost-effective solution. Okay, so Darren, take it from the top. Sure. First, every device has unique power requirements, voltage levels, load currents, and number of rails. Typically, this means onboard DC to DC conversion. We partner with leading power supply vendors to meet diverse requirements at the most attractive price, the smallest board area, and maximum efficiency. Our partners offer a number of highly integrated solutions for a vast array of end use cases. The cost of such a power supply solution varies widely depending on a number of factors, mainly the number of unique power rails and the amount of current being supplied for each rail. To help reduce the number of unique rails in the system, our devices minimize the number of different power rails and often use rail voltages already available in the system. In many instances, Low current requirements on some of the rails allow you to use tiny, inexpensive linear regulators. That cuts bomb costs and circuit board real estate. We've been able to deliver up to 30% power savings for all Arctic 7 and Zinc 7000 devices versus the nearest competitor without affecting performance. Since the cost of both the DC to DC converters and their associated passives like inductors or capacitors depend on the amount of current being consumed by each power rail, these power savings have a direct impact on overall power supply costs and required circuit board area. Okay, that's pretty significant. So, next? Next, programmable devices typically require storage for device configuration, while processors require storage for their program instructions, meaning system designers must factor in components such as configuration memory. While some currently available programmable solutions have integrated non-volatile memory, or NVM, within the device, they are currently designed on older process technologies, which means they leave much to be desired. They often don't deliver the signal processing capabilities, high clock speeds, and gigabit transceiver rates required by many of today's equipment manufacturers. In addition, storage requirements for many applications, such as protocol stacks, often exceed the capacity of these devices with integrated NVMs. Again, because of the older process technology severely restricts the amount of on-chip memory available. Other programmable solutions force system designers to use a proprietary, often very expensive, configuration solution from a single source vendor. Our devices, including the low-end portfolio, support the most popular open market flash memory interfaces. That means you get to choose from a wide variety of low-cost, commonly used configuration devices. They also support configuration via an integrated processor, making use of a centrally located NVM that is shared across a complete system. That can also increase the cost savings. That makes sense. Now, speaking of memory, what about storage that's not necessarily used for device configuration, but for things like data buffering? Our low-end products contain significant amounts of on-chip storage in the form of block RAM, distributed memory, processor caches, and static RAM. In many cases, the memory available within these devices is sufficient for the application, so there's no need for off-chip memory. But a number of applications, such as frame buffering and video processing, require additional external memory. System designers must factor in the cost of external memory over the entire product lifecycle. Our entire low-end portfolio supports DDR3 SD RAM. DDR3 is currently the most pervasive and lowest cost option for external memory, and that's likely to continue to be for quite some time. Got it. So taking advantage of the economies of scale with DDR3 cuts bomb costs. Exactly. Next, 
Our next generation design environment, the Vivado Design Suite, ensures maximum device utilization and extracts maximum performance from its silicon architectures. With the tool's hierarchical implementation and analytical engine, our low-end 7 series devices can deliver 20% better device utilization and a full speed grade of performance improvement over the competition. Further, our partial reconfiguration extends the inherent flexibility of an FPGA by allowing on-the-fly reprogramming that adds new functionality while the device continues to run. In many designs, you can swap a number of mutually exclusive functions in and out at will. Partial reconfiguration offers some really unique benefits from a bomb cost perspective. It can substantially reduce the size and power consumption of the device you need for a design. Hmm, Darren, it sounds a bit like magic there. <laughs> it's proven technology, actually. Lastly, without proper care, attention, and planning, the cost of the PCB can become a very significant part of the overall system cost. The key drivers for PCB cost are the number of layers required, the size of the board, and the need for cutting-edge PCB technology like laser vias and fine trace widths. Innovative packaging in our low-end portfolio products ensures the lowest cost PCB solution. For instance, take the Arctic 7 FPGA CPG236 package. The package itself measures a tiny 10 by 10 millimeter and has a 0.5 millimeter pitch ball grid array. That gives you more than 100 usable I.O. pins. Now that seems like an impressive package to pin ratio, but with a half millimeter pitch BGA, isn't that hard to route on the PCB? You might think so, Amelia, but the innovative ball grid pattern allows all of the balls to be routed on only two layers using standard spaces and via sizes. System integration, choosing an optimum power supply and distribution method, component size, and so forth, they all affect the PCB's size and the number of required layers. Minimizing these translates into substantially reduced PCB costs. So you've given us quite a few methods to lower bomb cost, but it would be useful to see an example of how these methods could be used in real-world applications. Sure, we have plenty of them to choose from. Let's start with a design that has migrated from a competing FPGA to a Spartan 6 FPGA. The Spartan 6 family is the industry's lowest cost leader and an ideal fit for simple to moderately complex bridging functions found in a range of applications. This includes market segments like infotainment, consumer, and industrial automation. In addition to high I.O. to logic cell ratios and small form factor package offerings, Spartan 6 offers best-in-class DSP and logic fabric performance while meeting the demanding power requirements of cost-sensitive systems. So how about a Spartan 6 example that uses these features? Well, this machine vision design is an application example using the Spartan 6 LX45 FPGA to interface with an image sensor. The FPGA performs complex image signal processing, implements custom IP, and transmits the recovered data to a central controller using various communication protocols. Some competitors' FPGAs, especially those manufactured using the older, larger process geometries like 55 nanometer, might offer integrated configuration storage, but they simply cannot perform the necessary digital signal processing required by this application. The only option would be to use an external DSP or ASSP to perform the intensive image signal processing, and that clearly increases bomb costs. Or you could use a more powerful FPGA, like the Spartan 6, and save as much as 34% on the bomb. Wow, those are pretty significant savings and a great example of avoiding the need for an entire ASSP. Do you have another example? Let's keep this going. Sure. Here's a design comparison for a design that migrated from a competing FPGA to an Arctic 7 device. For FPGA applications that demand more advanced functionality, Arctic 7 offers exceptional performance per watt and bandwidth per watt, leading the industry in nearly every aspect of performance for low-end programmable devices. One of the greatest distinctions of the Arctic 7 FPGA is its array of transceivers. With line rates exceeding 6 gigabits per second, double that of Spartan 6, and with a total aggregated serial bandwidth of 211 gigabits per second, 4x that of Spartan 6, the Arctic 7 family offers the industry's smallest and fastest transceiver-based devices available in a 10x10mm 10 10 package, making it an ideal, low-cost alternative 
for bandwidth-sensitive applications that might otherwise require more costly solutions. We recently expanded the family by introducing smaller Arctic 7 devices like A15T, which is comparable in logic size to a Spartan 6 LX16. Fantastic. The design? For this sensor interface design, an Arctic 7 FPGA solution provides a bomb cost savings of as much as 30% relative to the most comparable competing FPGA. These savings are realized by leveraging the Arctic 7's lower power and the two-layer PCB routing made possible by the Arctic 7's 10x10mm BGA connection technology. Additionally, the Arctic 7 device works with inexpensive off-the-shelf configuration devices and features the XADC that replaces the discrete analog mix signal components. It's interesting how component and PCB costs can really add up. Now, you talked earlier about replacing an external CPU. Do you have an example of that? We sure do. For applications that require more than just bandwidth, Zinc 7000 SoC family is an ideal solution. These devices bring together hardware, software, analog mix signal, and connectivity capabilities on a single chip platform. Fusing Arctic 7 fabric to a dual-core ARM Cortex-A9 processor, the low-end Zinc 7000 SoCs provide the highest level of system integration of the three families in our low-end portfolio. This, in turn, has downstream effects by reducing system power and maximizing performance. Okay, I think I got it. For this motor drive and integrated PLC design, using a Zinc SoC allows you to save as much as 23% in bomb costs relative to its nearest competition. Both before and after use an integrated processor as well as a soft processor core. In this example, the savings are realized by leveraging the Zinc SoC's larger on-chip memory capacity to eliminate the need for external memory by taking advantage of its XADC to implement power and temp monitoring and through cost savings from the reduced PCB area. So memory, processor, analog components, sync seems like a major integration play. Awesome. So Maureen, those were three really great use cases for Spartan, Ardex, and Zinc. Can you summarize the Xilinx low-end portfolio in a nutshell? I'm really glad you asked that, Amelia. Here's our low-end portfolio of devices. The portfolio features Spartan 6, our low-cost leader, Arctic 7, our price and bandwidth per watt leader, and finally, Zinc 7000 offering the highest integration and processing performance per watt. Each family has been optimized for very specific yet varying design requirements. We focus on delivering the highest functionality at the right price point while reducing system cost from a holistic perspective. After all, it's the total system cost that determines profitability. So let's summarize. When looking to reduce your overall bomb cost, don't forget to measure the cost of your FPGA selection by its impact on total bomb cost, not just the component itself. Take advantage of bomb cost reduction strategies and be sure to evaluate Xilinx low-end portfolio devices as part of your component search. We think you'll be pleased with the savings our devices can provide. If you're looking for more information, you can click the link below to access a white paper on bomb cost reduction, our low-end product selection guide, as well as a low-end portfolio backgrounder and portfolio brief. Well, thank you both for joining me today. It was a pleasure speaking with you. Thanks, Amelia. Thank you. Before we go, don't forget to click that link. There you'll find additional information on bomb cost and a host of related topics at the Xilinx low-end portfolio page. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, check out EE Journal's YouTube channel or the on-demand section on eejournal.com.